So welcome to Issaquah Senior Center uh, webinar uh, with our monthly webinar with the Overlake uh, Medical Clinic and Centers and Hospitals. Uh, today we have with us uh, Marie Yaboot, and she's an RN within the emergency department at uh, Overlake Hospital. And she's uh, representing, she represents the hospital around the topic of sepsis. sepsis. Um, and she also is involved with um, other uh, community education. So go ahead, Maria. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Welcome to Sepsis 911 and Aging. Um, as Catherine had mentioned, my name is Maria Boots. I'm speaking to you today about sepsis. Something that some of you have heard about or have heard a little about, um, but some may not know much about it um, and know that you're not alone. Um, however, it's something Oh, as a baby nurse, that's one of the things that I've learned from the previous hospital um, that I've learned um, about sepsis. And uh, a, po a popular physician I know and have worked with um, kind of helped started the sepsis treatment in, in the United States. So why am I doing this presentation? So my, again, my involvement in sepsis is I'm a nurse educator in emergency department. And as you know, in the emergency department, we see many sorts of infection. And all these infections can lead to sepsis and could really be um, life-threatening for some um, patients. And I just want, my intent is to raise awareness and I'm glad that you guys are attending these and because you can raise awareness yourself. Um, just note that according to the latest survey conducted annually by the Sepsis Alliance, um, which is really the, um, my resource for this presentation, um, uh, the Sepsis Alliance is the nation's leading sepsis nonprofit organization. Um, their information said that nearly one third of American adults have never heard the word sepsis, and many who have heard the word don't really know what it means or how important it is or how, how life threatening it could be. Um, let me go to the next slide. So, just um, to get some information from everyone about how much do you know about sepsis. I'm inviting everyone to participate in the poll um, and we will do the same. So this is a pre-presentation pre poll and then um, we'll do it again at the end of the session. So we'll take this short 10 question quiz. So let's see this one. Are you guys seeing the questions? Not yet, no. Okay. Did... Are you seeing it now? Um, we see a black screen with some Shaded people? <laughs> I don't know. Oh. I think, Marie, I think you might need to stop sharing your screen. Let me stop that. Oh, you want me to try sharing it? Yes, please. Okay. Hello. Hey there, welcome. Hi, I'm Josephine from At Work. Oh, hey Josephine. Hey. Okay, we see the questions now. There it is. Thank, thank you. 
Thank you, Catherine. So um, these are just some um, short questions that um, we want to find out how well they know about sepsis. So we'll start with number one, what is sepsis? Do you think it's an infection of the blood? Is it a local infection such as cellulitis or appendicitis? Is it a toxic reaction to an infection or is it a chronic disease? You can click your answer there. And I have nothing to click, so I can That's okay. Yeah, so people on, people on the phone, you can just write it down. Maybe you could write it down on a piece of paper or something. Mm -hmm. Just put number one and then your answer. Yeah. Okay. Now move on to the next question. Number two, is sepsis contagious? True or false? Next question, number three. Catherine, are you able to scroll it up? Yeah. Yeah, I have number three showing, yeah. at least from what I'm seeing. Okay. I'm seeing the question only. Who is at highest risk for developing sepsis? Are they newborn babies? And, um, um, oh, here we go. Sorry. So who is at risk for developing sepsis? Newborn babies, people with cancer, people over 65 years old, or all of the above? Hello for that. Um, is it Theo who just joined us? Welcome. Yes, we're, Theo. Hi, we're in the middle of doing a quick quiz before the full presentation. Um, if you could, um, if you have a place to click on the computer, do so. If not, you can just write numbers on a pen and paper and then you can write your answers. Uh, I'll move on to question number four. What type of infection can lead to sepsis? Bacterial, viral, is it fungal, parasitic infection, or all of the above? What type of infection can lead to sepsis? Bacterial, viral, fungal, parasitic, or all of the above? Move on to number five. When someone has severe sepsis, their chances of survival, survival drop by as much as 8% for every blank that goes by without treatment. Is it for every minute, every hour, every day, or none of the above? Move on to number six. Approximately how many people in the U.S. die each year because of sepsis? Is it 45,000? Is it 1,200,000? Is it 270,000 or 10,000? Move on to number seven. Sepsis is more deadly than breast cancer, AIDS, prostate cancer, or all of the above. Is sepsis more deadly than breast cancer, AIDS, prostate cancer, or all of the above? I think two, three more questions left. Eight, can sepsis be treated if it is identified early? True or false? 
sepsis can be treated if it's identified early, true or false. Number nine, which do you think of these celebrities died of sepsis? Muhammad Ali, Jim Henson, Patty Duke, or all of the above? Which of these celebrities died of sepsis? Muhammad Ali, Jim Henson, Patty Duke, or all of the above? And finally, number 10. All of the following are signs of sepsis, except fever or feeling chills, confusion or difficult to arouse or difficult to wake up, um, slow heart rate, extreme pain, or rapid breathing. All of the following are signs of sepsis, except fever or feeling chilled, confusion or difficult to arouse, slow heart rate, extreme pain, or rapid breathing. All right. So we can, oh, awesome. So some of you, so what is sepsis? It's an infection of the blood. Um, is the answer, so the correct answer is it's a toxic reaction to an infection. So that sepsis is a toxic reaction to an infection. It's not just blood, we could see it every, um, um, in, there's a lot of other tests to really determine um, sepsis, and it's not just of the blood. So number two, is sepsis contagious? It is false because it is an infection within the system. Although yes, um, recently in COVID, um, COVID patients can develop sepsis. Um, COVID alone is contagious, but sepsis is not. So it's kind of looking at that. Three, who is at risk? Who is at high, highest risk for developing sepsis? It is all of the above. Everyone is at risk from the little babies. To are, are you sharing the questions also? Um, am I seeing, what are you seeing right now? I don't see questions. Mm -mm. Oh, oh, okay. Um, did you? When I was going through the votes, you were seeing the, were you seeing the poll questions? When you were going through them, I saw them, but then when you finished uh, going through them, ask them, okay. uh, they disappeared. <laughs> so. Oh, okay. How about, oh, you're right here. Um, oh, I, I can re, I can relaunch the poll so they can see them. Um, you know, we can actually review everything again in the end. So thank you. But we did, okay. we didn't share. It just, just um, it's helpful to. Oh, here, share, share results, share results. Oh, there you go. Sorry. Okay. Can okay, you see you. it now? Yes. Okay. okay. Good. Thank you. Um, so I think the responses we got were, so one. Oh yeah, not everybody were able to click answers. But um, for number one, um, what is sepsis? The correct answer is it is a toxic reaction to an infection. Um, for number two, is sepsis contagious? It is not, as I mentioned earlier. Um, who is at higher, highest risk for developing sepsis? It's every age group. Um, it can be from the itty bitty babies to the um, elderly. Um, for what type of infection can lead to sepsis? And it's all of these. Any of these can lead to sepsis. Whether it's a simple skin infection that can lead to sepsis. Even a small stub toe that gets um, really infected that can lead to sepsis. Um, five, when someone has severe sepsis, their chances of survival drop as much as 8% for every hour. That goes by without treatment. And 
I cannot even tell you how much um, in when a, we see a patient in the emergency department, we have to recognize it quickly and we have to act within six hours to complete a full menu of um, treatments that we have to give to our patients because otherwise, as you see here, um, the survival drop as much as 8% for every hour that um, sepsis is identified and sepsis goes by. So if you or your family member um, comes in to a hospital and they say that they may have sepsis, please note to feel, um, feel free to ask, um, are you following a sepsis protocol? And it's okay to ask that because sometimes with the many things that's happening in an emergency setting, we have to, you have to refocus the staff to come back and inform you and act on what is going on for you or your family member who are visiting our emergency department. So number six, approximately how many people in the U.S. die each year of sepsis? It is 270,000. That is correct. Sepsis is more deadly than, and this is for all of the above. Um, it just in, um, oh, I'll, I'll tell, more, tell you more about the statistics in the preceding slides. Sepsis can be treated if it's identified early. That is correct. We have what, they, what we call a sepsis protocol or a sepsis bundle. Um, which of these celebrities died of sepsis? It's actually all of these people. Good answer for whoever answered that. And then um, all of the following are signs of sepsis except a slow heart rate, and that is correct because typically anyone with sepsis will um, just about part of our body's response to infection is bring up that heart rate to catch up with the, um, the metabolic needs of the patient. So um, good, good job on answering all of those questions. Now, to discuss in detail, let me start my screen share. Are you seeing the, okay. Are you seeing the presentation back? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah yes. So thank you for your um, pre-quiz answers there. So what is sepsis? Sepsis is our body's toxic response to an infection. Instead of fighting the infection, the body turns on itself to respond to, um, to the infection. Um, it kills, uh, sepsis is a major killer in the U.S., killing more than a quarter. As we said earlier, it's 270,000 um, people every year. Currently, sepsis is the number one killer in the in hospitals in in the U.S. Um, I believe this was a statistics back in like 2015, and note that about 87 percent of sepsis cases begin in the community and not in the hospital. So that's why it is um, a big part of emergency department protocols and treatment to recognize um, sepsis early. And when we have an, in, when someone has an infection, your immune system works hard to fight it. So sometimes it can fight the infection on its own and other times it needs help um, with drugs like antibiotics, antifungals, or antiviral medication. So sometimes you may go to a clinic, you may be um, diagnosed with an infection of a fingernail. They may or may not give you antibiotics because um, in recent um, medical treatments, they have really are trying to reduce um, prescribing antibiotics. However, it is important to know that 
if that simple infection is developing, like this finger infection is developing red streaking um, up to your arm, that could be a, a sign that you, um, that, this, that the infection is spreading. So be aware that those simple um, stub toe or a cut while you're um, preparing a meal and that small um, cut gets infected, it develops redness around that cut, and then you see streaking and swelling of that arm or that finger, that is a reason to get checked and perhaps get um, ask for some antibiotics because you don't want that infection to spread to the rest of your body. Um, sepsis is disproportionately affect, affecting older adults. Um, how how does this happen? So as in some, um, some of the studies from the Sepsis Alliance and some statistics that has been found, there are more than 80% of sepsis patients are 50 years of age or older. 70% of hospitalizations for sepsis are for people who are over 60 years old. Um, adults age um, 65 plus are 13 times more likely to be hospitalized with sepsis than adults younger than 65. Well, I'm sure we know that um, from that statistics alone, um, they, some patient, older adults will have higher risk because um, some long-term, um, like their medical history or other illnesses that they may have. Um, older sepsis survivors are at higher risk for long-term cognitive impairment and physical problems than others their age who were treated for other illness. What does that mean? So let's say, I'm 65, I get admitted to the hospital and I do recover, but when I recover, I may have long-term cognitive um, impairment or deficits just because I develop sepsis. I remember attending a, uh, actually attending the sepsis conference in Ju July from the Harborview conference um, Harborview Medical Center. And one of the speakers we had was a COVID patient and who developed sepsis. And she's a young individual. I want to say she was in her 30s. And she has not gone back to work because of um, she had this cognitive impairment, like a delay in processing information. Although, yes, she did not have any brain injury, but the COVID alone and the sepsis um, that she developed, it made her a little more slower to think. So she has not gone back to work um, just yet. But imagine, so that person was a 30-year-old. Imagine... Um, an older individual developing sepsis, they may have really long-term cognitive um, effects on them. Finally, 76% of older sepsis survivors are more likely to be discharged to a skilled nursing facility rather than to their previous living arrangements. So again, very important to recognize this early so you or your loved ones doesn't get um, get too delayed in in the treatment of sepsis. Oh, sorry, I keep scrolling the wrong way. Um, what sepsis is not? So sepsis is not blood poisoning. It is not an in, not just an infection. It is a toxic reaction to infection. Um, sepsis is not contagious and sepsis is not rare. So it happens, I want to say, for just for the emergency department alone. Um, I think our recent statistics, um, we see about 20 patients in a month that develop the severe sepsis or septic shock um, stages of sepsis. 
um, those are the ones who develop um, organ dysfunction, like kidneys gets affected, their, um, their blood pressure drop where we have to give them lots of fluids, or sometimes they're not responding to these fluids that they have to be admitted to the intensive care unit to get um, medicines to bring their blood pressure up. Those are called vasopressors. So note that, yeah, it is not a rare condition. Why have so few people heard of sepsis? Um, I believe in the healthcare community, sepsis isn't necessarily a commonly used word, which is actually surprising because it is not an uncommon illness, but I think we just don't use the word enough. Um, we will say, yes, you do have a finger infection that is kind of spreading to your arm, but that could be developing into something um, uh, really significant. Um, unfortunately, doctors tend to not use the word sepsis instead of saying things like complications of pneumonia or complications from an infection. Instead, they could really say sepsis. Um, even death certificates often default to the original diagnosis, um, which could be cancer or another illness, stating complications of breast cancer or complications of etc. Um, however, if doctors and nurses aren't using the word sepsis, it's more difficult for patients and families to learn about it. Um, we all need to start using the word. All together, can you say with me, sepsis? Sepsis, sepsis, sepsis. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, ah. Sorry. So I want to share a video that the Sepsis Alliance had put together. This is really a great snapshot of what sepsis is about. So here we go. Are you seeing the screen of a video? Mm -hmm. Okay. 1.7 million Americans develop sepsis, a life-threatening medical condition that arises when the body initiates a powerful immune response against an infection. Anyone can get sepsis, but two-thirds of all sepsis oh, cases occur in... Okay, let me share... Thank you for speaking up. You're welcome. Here we go. Every year, more than 1.7 million Americans develop sepsis, a life-threatening medical condition that arises when the body initiates a powerful immune response against an infection. Anyone can get sepsis, but two-thirds of all sepsis cases occur in people over 60. Sepsis kills more people in the United States than breast cancer, prostate cancer, and AIDS combined. Older adults, especially those with chronic health conditions like heart disease and various types of cancer, are more likely to succumb to sepsis. However, early recognition of sepsis symptoms can save lives and reduce the risk of long-term effects. Sepsis is caused by bacterial, viral, parasitic or fungal microbial infections that trigger overwhelming inflammation and blood thickening. Normally, the body's immune system targets invading microbes with a tempered response. However, in sepsis, the body overreacts, triggering a cascade of chemical messengers that cause inflammation within blood vessel linings. When this happens, small blood clots form, first at the site of infection and then throughout the body. Widespread inflammation and blood clotting impede oxygen and nutrient delivery to tissues and organs, resulting in organ dysfunction. An infection may begin in an organ like the lungs or kidney, or be introduced through an open sore, surgical incision, or invasive medical device like a urinary catheter or feeding tube. Common symptoms of sepsis include fever, rapid heart rate, and rapid breathing. The organ affected by the infection often dictates the other signs and symptoms of sepsis. For example, if the lung is the primary site of infection, as in pneumonia, 
The person may experience fever coupled with shortness of breath, painful coughing, and discolored mucus. Not all infections develop into sepsis. However, progression from a localized infection to full-blown sepsis can occur within hours. Therefore, it is important to swiftly recognize the signs and symptoms of an infection that's out of control. When an older person becomes septic, fever may be absent. In fact, the opposite can occur with the development of a cold, clammy skin temperature known as hypothermia. Older patients are also more likely to exhibit sudden mental confusion or delirium as a major part of their presenting signs, along with fatigue, malaise, weakness, sudden shortness of breath, poor appetite, chills, dizziness, and low blood pressure. When these symptoms occur, coupled with an infection, it is time to seek immediate medical attention. Older adults may be resistant to urgent medical care, but timely medical treatment is imperative to increase survival, since for every hour delay in appropriate treatment, the risk of death increases by up to 8%. Sepsis becomes more dangerous with age and treatment is more likely to involve hospitalization and admission to the intensive care unit, or ICU. 70% of sepsis hospitalizations are in adults 60 years and older. Older adults admitted to the ICU for sepsis are also generally sicker, require longer lengths of stay, and may experience significant long-term cognitive impairment and physical limitations. Among older adults who do survive sepsis, 76% are more likely to be discharged to a skilled nursing facility, unable to return home. Hmm. To limit sepsis causing infections, seniors, their loved ones, and caregivers should receive flu and pneumonia vaccinations and practice good hand washing and good personal hygiene. Wound dressing and nursing care should use sterile techniques whenever feasible. Sepsis is common, deadly, and costly. It affects older and Oh, okay. Uh, Marie, it looks like it's uh, disorders or no, it stopped for a while. Now, now it's going. It's going again. Okay, sorry. Looks like we only have a minute left. Vulnerable to sepsis. To help reduce sepsis deaths in seniors, practice preventative strategies that reduce the spread of germs. Know the signs of sepsis, and seek early treatment. Together. We can save lives. You got to see the end there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Great video, right? It really summarizes everything about um, about sepsis. Now um, it's about time to really know more about sepsis. And this slide right here is a really great um, information for everyone. If you could actually screenshot this and print it and post it on your refrigerators. I really encourage you to do so. Um, so when it comes to sepsis, remember that you have to watch for this information. Let's start, and a good mnemonic here is time. So T for temperature, high or lower than normal. As you um, heard in the video, even low temperature could really be um, a sign um, of developing sepsis. Sometimes you have developed that high fever, but then you're starting to really um, get lower temperature. This is common for um, patients with who are on chemotherapy because their body does not necessarily respond to infection by developing a fever. So they can just stay in a lower temperature, but um, still developing something, a toxic, um, a toxic um, reaction to their body. And this is in the intensive care unit or in hemodynamics, they call it um, 
cold shock where a patient with a low temperature could really um, be developing sepsis. Um, I for infection, so they may have signs of in, signs and symptoms of an infection. And then M for mental decline. So if someone you know is um, appearing confused, um, looking, appearing sleepy, difficult to wake up, or they're being repetitive than usual. Well, first of all, think about, is that a sign of stroke? And if not, and if they have recent infection, think about sepsis. Finally, letter E for extremely ill. Um, patients might say, I feel like I might die, or I feel like they're reporting severe pain or severe discomfort these are signs of, of sepsis. So watch for a combination of these symptoms. And then if you, if you suspect sepsis, please see a doctor urgently. And of course, if there's no one that can take you to, to the doctor or to the hospital, call 911 so you can be taken to a, a nearest hospital. And just tell them, I am concerned about sepsis is the key word there. And tell them why you're concerned about sepsis. Let's say you had a recent pneumonia or you had a recent urinary tract infection. Those are the common ones that we see in our emergency department. Um, sepsis is a medical emergency. If you or your loved one has sepsis, the chances of survival, um, as we had mentioned a, a few times already, um, it drops the survival rate by as much as 8% every hour of treatment that is delayed. So what do you do? You call 911, you tell the operator, I think it may be sepsis, and use that word sepsis. Don't be afraid to, to say that. Why does sepsis occur? Um, we did say this, that it happens from, it's a toxic response to an infection. Um, and I know we already talked about how sepsis in the body, that the body, sepsis is the body's toxic response to an infection. So when you have an infection, your immune system works hard to fight it, but sometimes your immune systems um, turns and starts to attack itself. So this is what happens in sepsis. So you must have an infection to have sepsis, but the type of infection is sometimes not always identified. So let's say you have um, like a pain to like your flank area to your back. Um, you may be developing some chills or a slight fever, but you got tested or you don't know um, if you have any infection or not. Um, I've seen it where, or no, someone will ask you, do you have any urinary symptoms or burning in urination? And you may say no, but then what I've seen it in a patient where um, it ended up being a kidney infection or what we call pyelonephritis. It's really the infection had already gone up to the kidneys and they're not showing symptoms of a urinary tract infection. And then that kidney pain or that flank pain develop in weakness and then they develop fever. Think about um, sepsis already developing. Some types of infection that may lead to sepsis, we, I, we mentioned in the, in the video, bacterial. Um, most common type of infection that can lead to sepsis, it can be spread many ways and result in illnesses like urinary tract infections or UTI, MRSA or the methicillin resistant um, staph aureus infection, and then the bacterial pneumonia. Um, for viral, it can be spread by touch. What's the viral infection that you could think of? Mm -hmm. Flu. Flu, there is a vaccine for it. So please um, um, get um, immunized or get that vaccine. And remember, you have to get it every year. 
uh, or get the vaccine every year. So this one can be spread by touch, body fluid exchange in the air, and it can in include illnesses like the flu and the viral pneumonia. Now for fungal infections, most often appear on the skin, but can be caused by spores inhaled into, a into the lungs or injected into the body. Um, a common one here is, it could be just a cut or a bug bite that develops into like a yeast infection. Um, and then finally, parasitic or um, really, I, I call this as bugs or worms, um, such as malaria, which is spread by mosquitoes. Um, so with sepsis, when left untreated, it can progress to septic shock. So as we mentioned earlier, um, it starts as an infection, and then could develop to a sepsis, and then it could develop to seps septic shock. As we mentioned earlier, um, for every hour that um, it's left untreated, um, survival rate drops every hour. So when we recognize sepsis and we did not see it, and then the patient's blood pressure is dropping and then their heart rate is going up, it's developing into septic shock. So this is really why it's very important to recognize it quickly. Ah, sorry, keep scrolling the wrong way. Ten, no. Slide 14, okay. Septic shock is a severe and potentially fatal infection. It is, it could, it occurs when sepsis leads to life-threatening low blood pressure. And sometimes it can be difficult to treat. Um, and next slide, who gets sepsis? So sepsis does not discriminate anyone of any age um, can really get sepsis. These are those who are at higher risk, including people with chronic illness, such as diabetes or COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The very young are also at higher risk because they don't have a fully developed immune system just yet. And on the other end of the spectrum, older adults are at risk too, as are people who have weaker immune systems, um, which can be caused by taking medications like steroids or chemotherapy. All of these increases the risk of sepsis. Also, if you've had sepsis before, you may also be at higher risk of developing it again. So it can happen again. So some um, celebrities who had developed sepsis, it's Muhammad Ali in 2016, Patty Duke, Jim, Jim Henson, Pope John Paul II. I think he developed pneumonia and developed into sepsis. Etta James in 2012, and then Paul Allen in 2018. Some complications of um, after the treatment. So there's a thing called post-sepsis syndrome. Unfortunately, the treatment needed to save people from dying from sepsis can cause long-term consequences such as post-sepsis syndrome, um, organs not working properly, and even amputations um, could do that. So post-sepsis syndrome is a condition that affects up to 50% of sepsis survivors. They are left with physical and or psychological long-term effects, such as insomnia, difficulty getting to sleep or staying asleep. They may develop nightmares, um, hallucinations, and sometimes panic attacks. Some develop disabling muscle and joint pains, extreme fatigue, poor concentration, just like the person I mentioned to you earlier that developed COVID 
and sepsis from COVID, de decreased mental functioning, loss of self-esteem and self-belief because they're getting frustrated that they're not um, recovering fast enough. Similarly, there are many survivors who are diagnosed with um, post-traumatic stress disorder following their treatment. In severe cases, amputations are required after surviving sepsis, especially if this happens when they receive medications that um, increases blood pressure, um, such as epinephrine, because their um, fingertips doesn't get um, circulation and the circulation has been centered in the center that the fingertips don't get um, yeah, circulation to those fingertips that they develop, um, that they may need some amputation. Um, yeah, and sometimes, yeah, that when too much tissues die, it has to be removed, which could lead to amputation. And after surviving sepsis, many experience impaired cognitive or physical function, um, particularly significant among people over the age of 65. In fact, on average, older sepsis survivors experience one to two new limitations in their activities of daily living after they were hospitalized. How do we prevent um, sepsis is really preventing infection. Hand washing, how long do we have to wash? I hope we all remember that by now from our COVID um, instructions. Hand wash for at least 20 seconds. You wanna care for the open wounds, um, wash it with soap and water. Um, when you, I always tell my patients when you have to let a wound air out um, during the day and cover it in your sleep um, just so it doesn't pick up any bacteria from sheets or whatever um, that you don't see. If, of course, if you have to go to work with open wounds, you have to cover it. And then, but if you're, once you're at home, let it air out so it will develop healing. Um, Excuse me. I know this sounds simple for open wounds, but don't pour alcohol on an open wound. Don't put um, hydrogen peroxide daily on an open wound just because those chemicals, when it um, goes to the skin tissue, it kills the tissue and it delays healing, which then would develop infection. Um, you only take antibiotics as prescribed just because... Um, not everything can be treated with antibiotics. Um, flu is not treated with antibiotics. Um, viral infections is not treated with antibiotics. That's why there are antiviral medications um, specific for those. And then of course, um, another prevention is staying up to date with your vaccination. So take your flu shots, your pneumonia vaccines, your shingles vaccines, and hopefully once COVID, um, COVID vaccine is available, please get it. What can you do to advocate? So up to half of sepsis deaths could be prevented by timely recognition and treatment. So you want to know the symptoms. Um, say the word sepsis, don't be afraid. Um, Express your concerns to the medical team. That's why we want um, we want to increase sepsis awareness, and hopefully after today you know more about sepsis and can recognize the symptoms. In addition to recognizing sepsis, it's also important to express your your concerns to your medical team. Um, please. If you want to know more about sepsis, go to the website called sepsis.org, and that's really the Sepsis Alliance um, website where you can learn more about sepsis. So again, that's sepsis.org. I think that wraps up our presentation. Um, uh, for the, I think I will skip the after poll. It's really a repeat of the um, 
of the poll that we had at the beginning of the session. Um, and since we not everyone has access to the clicking of the answers, I think we can um, save that time for some Q&A, questions and answers. Any questions you have for me? Yes, I have one. Yes. Um, it said in the video that uh, 1,700,000 people come down with, with sepsis, but mm -hmm. in our uh, quiz, it said 270,000. Oh, those are deaths. So oh. The 270,000 are the number of deaths annually, and the 1 million statistics are the diagnosed um, cases that are reported. Our state actually um, monitors that and we report our sepsis. <coughs> um, yeah, question, what was that? MRSA or something, some disease? MRSA, Dr. yes. What mm -hmm. is that? Oh, it's a, so MRSA, methicillin resistant staph infection or staphylococcus aureus. It's, um, I'm not muted now. It's a, it's a bacterial infection that can be, you can pick up from any surface. One um, story I could remember was um, in a locker room of a sports facility, or it's like a, a high school locker room. There was a good number of um, athletes who developed MRSA because it's in the surfaces of the area. So MRSA can be picked up anywhere. And some, I believe um, some, no, not some, most healthcare workers actually have it living in their nares. So that's why if you come to Overlake for a, um, a surgery and you have risk for M MRSA, they actually swab your nose um, to check and find out if you have it before you go to surgery. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question about, um, I, I typed it in, but um, you know, you said you should let the wounds uh, be open if possible. Mm -hmm. um, there's a type of Band-Aid, I think it's colloidal. Yeah. Um, are they, good or bad then? So those are good because I think the colloidal, I, I'm not a wound care specialist, but what I know though is it is used in the hospital um, because it allows for covering and it allows some cushion and it allows for a wound to, wound to breathe. Um, those are specifically used for the tailbone infections when our patients are unable to turn themselves and they develop the ulcer on their tailbone. Mm -hmm. So those are specific for deeper wounds. But if let's say the wound is just in your extremity, feel free to uncover it and let it air out because it will allow it to dry on a natural way. Unless of course it's weeping or oozing, cover it until the, 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 the weeping and oozing um, so I, I actually, I actually use those because it does um, heal mm -hmm. under the band aid. Correct. Um, and I, I use them usually just for finger cuts or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, my, um, we have recently um, got in pharmacies here well recently i have been in a pharmacy since the shutdown but before that uh so maybe last year we started getting some from the uk mm. um and i tried those and i had a funny reaction to them and um my sister-in-law who lives in the uk um also um, was using them and they gave it to her in hospital mm. um, but then she had a funny reaction to them oh. um, so but the ones that I buy here I've had no problem 
Mm. Um, and and they're really easy, you know, your the wound dries and heals really quickly. Mm -hmm. But now you say, <laughs> you know, I should open it. Um, mm -hmm. So what, open it at night maybe? I, I, I always tell my patient, open it when you're able to control whatever touches it. Because if it's something that you're going to sleep on and then rub around the sheets, mm. and we don't necessarily wash our sheets every day. So right. that can pick up some infection just on, okay. on your awake times that you okay. uncover it. Um, of course, if you have products like a col colloid dressing, Feel free to use them and if you have but if um you don't have that resource and you don't have the the resource of ba other bandages you can open it um to air out and then cover it at night mm. okay i have a question and it's this maybe the the it was already answered in a visual but i can't see the visual it says that it has extreme pain. Does that mean that it's at the site of the infection, anywhere in your body, or a certain spot? And if you have a urine infection, is it inside your body, the pain? Yeah. So let's start with the pain. So it can be a localized pain. So let's say I mentioned earlier the example of a kidney pain. So it can be in one localized or a specific part of the body, or it could be severe pain all over and you have other symptoms like chills and body weakness and shortness of breath like sometimes lung infection or a pneumonia doesn't show up as pain in our chest it could be just heaviness on our back and you have the shortness of breath so it can be mm -hmm. localized or pinpoint to a specific body part or it could be the rest of the body you mentioned about the uti um mm -hmm. Typically, advanced or early symptoms of urinary tract infection could be um, urinary oh, pain in urinating, sometimes dribbling to urinate. Sometimes it could be um, like pain in the area all the time or pain in the area during um, urination. Um, so those are early signs of urinary tract infection. Sometimes other people don't develop those signs and symptoms that the infection just really goes up to the kidney without mm -hmm. the simple signs of UTI. So then that becomes mm -hmm. specific. So for a UTI, it is a specific to that body part. Um, and then mm -hmm. for other people, it just develops a kidney infection. Mm -hmm. well, well, I was wondering also if you in that thing, would it be very, um, your, your body, when someone goes to touch it, would you have pain there as well or just in a certain area? No, typically, I mean, you know, it, yeah, I have mm -hmm. not uh, heard of that report that when you touch a certain location that, mm -hmm. so I'm talking specifically about urinary tract infection. Okay. Um, okay. okay. Because I know in when someone has a kidney infection and we put mm -hmm. our hand on like the kidney area and we just tap it and you feel that mm -hmm. pain in that kidney, that could be a sign mm -hmm. of kidney infection. That's called uh, oh. positive like uh, flank tenderness. So. Okay, thank you, thank you. I want to say that um, I've learned so much from your presentation today. I always thought sepsis was something that young women get when they leave their tampon in too long. So I have learned so much other than that. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, it's beyond uh, a tampon. Um, that one is called toxic shock syndrome. And that one has its own set of symptoms, but of course that can develop into sepsis. Yes. Thank you. Josephine has a question. Okay. 
No, I don't. I already asked it. Oh, okay. Um, my niece, my my friend's niece was 27. Uh, she got very sick at home, but she had a controlling partner, and um, she didn't get to the hospital until she was too late to save. And and that was my, you know, first hearing of of sepsis. Um, so. You know, this has sort of opened up a a greater greater understanding, um, and I did think it took longer, you know, to to develop yeah. than um, well. I put a I put a day because I think that was the longest when you asked that question. So I put a day for eight. Mm -hmm. Was it eight percent worse mm -hmm. um, hourly? Mm -hmm. Is that was that your yes yeah yes. so and can so can you actually tell that the person is is developing the symptoms correct so in quickly. our i can say yes to that because our hospital um here at overlake our emergency department we have tests available to us um that can run in two minutes it's a blood test that can um, tell us whether someone is in is developing sepsis or are they in severe sepsis or septic shock or will develop that and it's called lactate or lactic acid it's the small cartridge we draw blood if someone comes up comes into our emergency department and you have either high heart rate a temperature um, so actually, no, if you have a temperature plus I have high heart rate or a fast respiratory, like fast breathing, that is a clue for us to do that test. And if the test is 4.0 and higher, you are already in the severe sepsis, septic shock category where we really have to give you 30 ml per kilo of IV fluid. And 30 ml per kilo for a hundred kilo patient is like three liters of IV fluids already, three bags of fluids. And if your blood pressure doesn't go up or doesn't get better after that liter, we go to um, it stopped. Yeah, you're frozen. Oh, sorry. I know you were too. <laughs> um, so we missed after the one li the one litre. Oh yeah. So the thirty ml per kilo fluid bolus. Um, that we would give for a patient with a lactate of four and higher. We would, if you're a hundred kilo patient, we give you three liters of IV fluid from the get go. Of course. Is that, I mean, you say you said, I know you're from Overlake, but is that a standard yes. in other hospitals also? Yes, now? it's actually a national standard and it is um, established and monitored by the by Medicare and Medicaid. And our performance on sepsis is um, really uh, reimbursed from, no, the hospital is reimbursed from their good um, sepsis um, response. Okay, thank you. Karen, I see a Japanese woodblock print behind you. Is that right? Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually, they're all... Um, yeah, we lived in Japan for a while, and um, nice. my daughter my husband loves the wood block, so my daughter brought him bought her, him that print. Um, nice. And my uncle embroidered this. Oh wow! <laughs> oh my gosh! Which is um, 
anyway, it's two ladies, but I mean, it's very intricate and that. Yeah, um, and that, that was his hobby, embroidery, which oh. is kind of unusual, you know, for, but. Well, like, like Rosie, Rosie Greer did, uh, um, pin, what is it, uh, Needlepoint. That's a kind of an embroidery. Yes, yes. Really nice. I had to move because I couldn't, my husband was cooking um, and it got a bit noisy. So I'm sitting on the stairs now and uh -huh. <laughs> just to get away from the noise. Cause I wanted to ask you the question. Oh so. yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Say hi to him for me. I will. <laughs> yes. And I'll tell him the signs and symptoms too, yeah, yeah. in case it's me that it happens Correct. to. Yeah. And, um, and uh, my Pilates group, I meet with them, not that we exercise now at the moment, but I'll, I'll pass them on to them. Yeah. Um, One more thing to worry about now. Yeah. <laughs> now, let me ask you, does any one of you have any, um, know of anyone who developed sepsis? I know one of you said that earlier before yeah. we started. Two people. Yeah, one of my friends, she had a, a cat bite and it oh. went up her arm. So yeah, in the hospital for several days. Correct. Yeah, those cat bites, dog bites, those are tricky because we, um, when they come in, so let's say it's a big gash and we can't close it or the doctor will just suture certain portions, but they will not really close it all the way because the intent is for whatever bacteria that had gone in is supposed to come out. Mm -hmm. So, and we always tell, look for signs of infection when, you know, that wound develops like redness around and then it just streaks and mm -hmm. streaks and that's something mm -hmm. that is a, bad infection um, I so, antibiotics for that one um so with a cat bite if it's just um you know if the cat's just annoyed with you um and it's a bite you know quick bite um that could that be even if it's only a quick dig could that be a problem as far as infection yeah so what you look for so when you let's say just at home you get a cat bite or a little scratch wash it with soap and water um you don't necessarily have to put any antibiotic ointment on it correct um but what you want to watch for in the coming days five to seven days is that that area is not developing any redness and that it's not getting painful and it's not swelling up because if those any of those are a combination of those um, symptoms begin it is developing an infection then that's the time you perhaps check with your primary care doctor can you take a look at this bite do i need antibiotics for this okay yeah Any other questions you guys could think of? Well, I'd just like to thank you because um, it was really informative. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and also very easy to, um, to understand, which is what you need when it's, you know, <laughs> um, something that you need to keep, you know, in your, in your mind and Correct. if you not, know nothing about it. Yes. Um, I, I would say I want to credit 
the sepsis.org or sepsis alliance they actually um created this standard um presentation for all healthcare workers to and distribute and really to increase awareness um for about sepsis and just to give you a background of, Sep of sepsis alliance it was started by a person his um, name is Mr. Flatley. I can't remember his first name now, but his um, daughter developed sepsis and unfortunately um, passed away from it. And then with the knowledge and experience that he have, he started the Sepsis Alliance or sepsis.org. And from there it, um, they started joining conferences and i've learned about sepsis alliance in my participation in the pacific northwest sepsis conference that has um that was started by uw medical center and harbor view medical center um i believe we have been doing our sepsis conference for eight nine years years in a row now and I have been a part of their planning um, committee in the last three years and then this year in July we did our virtual um, sepsis conference for healthcare and we did it as a one day we had over a thousand registered participants um, which really informed a lot of people so I give credit to Sepsis Alliance, sepsis.org, and then the Pacific Northwest um, Sepsis Conference that I have been a part of. Oh, someone had asked, will PowerPoint and info be available after? Um, that was a question for Karen. I can actually send, oh, I think I did send the PowerPoint PDF already to Catherine so she can send it to you guys. Um, yeah, I don't have, I don't have everybody's um, contact information. So, um, so I can, um did you have a way to email you Catherine? uh yeah um yeah i can put my email in the chat Did that disappear or do I press the chat? Oh, click on the chat. Go. Oh, yeah, yeah, click on the chat okay. and you can see it. Yeah. Yeah. And I have, um, and I have uh, Josephine and Bernice's uh, email. Um, I do have Theo's. Um, uh, there's um, Olivia and Karen. Yeah. Um, yeah, Sherry, I think. Uh, yeah, Sherry, I have yours. Yeah, so the only ones I don't have, I think, are Olivia and Karen. Okay. Yeah, so if I could get, uh, I could get Olivia and Karen to send me emails. Okay. And everybody else I, I do have. Okay. I mean, I searched, uh, yeah, so that'd be great. And then I can send it out. 